Der erste Talk ist von Milena Marin. Sie arbeitet bei Amnesty International. Ich habe Amnesty letztens hier mal in Berlin besucht. Um, uh, so I, I'm actually going to switch to English because her talk is in English. Um, so I visited uh, Amnesty International, their offices in Berlin recently, and it's quite fun. They, they, they walked me around the space. It's like a huge building. They have like really nice offices. And then we looked outside the window and uh, on the first floor, there was like some industrial space. And I was wondering, so what's going on there? Is that, is that part of Amnesty? And they were like, yeah, that's, that's part of Amnesty, Amnesty. That's the printing facility. So the Amnesty office in Berlin, they have their own printing shop. And that basically shows how, how important print still is for Amnesty, um, at least uh, in some ways. How important the digital aspect uh, is at Amnesty uh, is what Milena Marin is going to explain to us uh, now. She's a researcher there and works on a project that she's going to tell us all about now. Milena, take the stage. And I take the cake. Hello, everybody. Oh. All right. Thank you so much for having me, having me here. I'm going to speak in English, as Stefan said. Uh, please make signs if I say something you don't understand, if I speak too fast or anything like that. I'm really happy to explain more what I'm talking about. Um, so I work with Amnesty International, and I hope the organization doesn't need much introduction. Many of you have heard about us. Uh, but basically what we do is, we're an international organization, we work for human rights, we do a lot of research, either regional or thematic, and we try to expose human rights violations. And once we, we did uh, research and we understood the causes and the factors and everything, we do advocacy, we do campaigning, we mobilize millions of people, we advocate with governments, with international organizations, and what we really try to achieve is change. Um, as Stefan said, we are a very traditional organization. Most of our research um, is, is very traditional. We go on the ground, we collect testimonies from victims, um, and when we try to make conclusions. But recently, we've been trying to use more and more new streams of data. Um, and in this new day and age, we, we face, as you can imagine, many challenges, but I'm going to talk about two of the main challenges. One challenge is the data overload problem. Um, while 10 years ago, our researchers faced a scarcity of data, they didn't have enough information about what's happening on the ground. Uh, they didn't know how to access locations where we're not allowed to go. There are many countries that are closed to our researchers where we can't, we can't access, we can't go on the ground, we can't collect testimonies. So how do we conduct human rights research there? Uh, so while 10 years ago, maybe we had a problem with that there was not enough data, now we have a problem that maybe there's too much data. So this graph shows that on YouTube, every minute, there's 500 hours of footage uploaded. Uh, in total, there's something like 46,000 years content, worth of content on YouTube. So how are we supposed to understand what content is relevant for our work, what content is not relevant? Can we use these videos to do demonstrate human rights violations? Um, how, how do we need to verify those? How do we even go about using so much information? And not to talk about satellite imageries, remote sensing, other social media reports. There's so much data available to investigators these days. So how can we use it? Another problem we're facing as a human rights organization doing research and campaigning is collectivism. Um, all organizations, I'm sure you're probably part of this kind of organizations, metrics, 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 trying to engage many people online, have many likes on Twitter, have many retweets, have many social media followers. What does it really mean? Does that change anything in the actual world? Uh, so what we're trying to do is trying to give people more meaningful ways to participate. We think there's a huge value in having supporters and mobilizing and engaging people, but is really social media the only way we can do it? Um, so our solution and what I'm going to talk about today is a project called Amnesty Decoders. So our solution to data overload and to clicktivism is some sort of large scale on online collective action. So we're using crowdsourcing and microtasking and we're inviting people around the world, people that care about human rights, to help us 
turn mountains of messy information into structured information. So we have, we have documents, we have videos, we have all sorts of data that is messy and structured and usable, and we try to use these online volunteers to analyze the data. So let me tell you a little bit more about what, what that means. Anybody knows who this guy is, the Mechanical Turk? <laughs> So probably you've heard of a service by Amazon called Mechanical Turk. It's a commercial service um, available to businesses that want to use kind of micro workers, typically from the south of the world, that are paid a cent per task to do things like copying email addresses, digitizing pictures, digitizing documents that are scanned, and so on. So the technology that they use is microtasking. And the, the reason I like this Mechanical Turk, so this was a 18th century invention. It was a machine that would beat anybody at chess. And that's in the 18th century, right? So there was a, a sort of myth around, oh, there was a slide missing. There was a myth around um, technology and how advanced technology is that we have robots that basically beat humans at chess. And we know that even today it's really hard to achieve that. Uh, so what happened was that there was a guy under, under that box that obviously controlled the machine um, and, and was really good at chess. So today I think we still have that kind of paradox, that impression that technology is a bit more advanced than we, that, that it really is, that algorithms and machine learning and artificial intelligence can do everything. You know, they will take our jobs, they will do all the data analysis, and there's no more, for, no more need for people. And we're trying to contradict that a little bit with this project to say, actually, there's some things that people can do way better than, than machines. And just to give you an illustration, at a, at a task that is like this, compare the two images, obviously, a machine would, would do very well. It would be very easy to spot that one of the picture is different than the other picture, right? But at a task like this, where you have to compare these two images, where it's about context and it's about subtlety, a machine wouldn't do very well. So our bet is that still, uh, in analyzing large amounts of data that have this kind of subtlety in it, that have this kind of context, people will do better. And actually, right now, we're using a combination of machines and, and people. But let me tell you about, about what people do. So we've been, we've been planning quite a lot this, this project, which is using microtasking for human rights research. So microtasking is that process of taking a very large problem, splitting it into very small pieces, and distributing it, these pieces over the internet. So we have micro tasks that are given to people. Um, it, they are you know, on their own. People can do it without much training, without background, just a very quick tutorial, and anybody can contribute. So we think that we can use any type of data. So you can use pictures, documents, videos, satellite images, social media, SMSs, maps any kind of data that is a little bit, um, that is, is very large in volume, but is consistent in terms of analysis, and you just need a lot of patients and potentially a lot of people. We work on lots of social, um, human rights issues, from illegal demolitions to protest monitoring to extractive industries and so on. And then we ask people to do, to do these kind of things, to classify, identify, compare, count, and so on. So for example, just looking at videos, we can, we can trace illegal use of weapons by asking people to identify very specific features. So by looking at very specific types of weapons, by searching for insignia on, on police. Uh, so they, they all have very specific um, insignia about the, the division they are working in, in their, their identification number, and so on. So we can do very detailed kind of analysis. We also are looking to use satellite images to work around refugees and see, for example, growth of refugee camps by counting the tents. And all that we only are able to do by engaging tens of thousands of people. Researchers would be completely overwhelmed to, to do this, um, and, and we just don't have enough manpower. And we're talking about an organization that is very large, as Amnesty is. And we still don't have enough manpower to tackle the big problems out there. So we think that people from around the world can help us. So that's, that's broadly what the, the project is about. And I'm going to talk a little bit about our recent project called Decode Darfur. So this, this project we launched about October last year. Um, we did some traditional research, um, and we found that in Darfur, um, as recent as last year, there were hundreds of villages that were destroyed by the Sudanese government in the process of chasing rebel militias. So you, you all know about Darfur from the early 2000s, and you know there's been a problem, you know there's been a genocide, but it's kind of 
out of sight, out of mind. Uh, but our research shows that the problem is still happening. We're still having villages destroyed. And using satellite images, you can see very clearly how a, a village was there one day, and the next day it's completely raised to the ground, doesn't exist anymore. So our researchers looked at a very small area of Darfur, something like 3,000 square kilometers, and they found tens of villages that were destroyed. Um, they spent months doing so. So we thought that that's one of the perfect examples to engage these decoders online, because it was quite easy to spot the villages that was, were destroyed, and when we wanted to be able to cover all of Darfur. So not just 3,000 square kilometers, but 500,000, which is the size of Spain, more or less, to give you uh, a comparison. Um, most of Darfur is very remote. There's lots of desert there, and something like 5% of this area is inhabited. Um, there's lots of burned villages. Um, villages there, there's been various rounds of destruction, so we were trying to see, to, to find villages that were destroyed really recently. So we've built a platform, uh, an online platform available on mobile, available on, on desktop. And we asked people in the first place, because we didn't really know where these villages are. Like, you, you must know that um, in, in, in Western Europe, in, in the States, in the develop, developed world, we have such detailed maps of everything. It doesn't happen in Africa, unfortunately. So the first stage of the project was just to look for these villages, to see where do people live. So we put up this really simple project. People had to look at a small part of a satellite image. So I told you microtasking is splitting a large task, so taking the map of their force, splitting it into small bits, um, and asking people very simple questions. So in this case, the, the question was, can you see a village, and can you mark those squares where you see a village? Uh, we did quite a lot of gamification around it. We, we told people, you know, how many square kilometers they decoded in a session overall, uh, how, many, how many square kilometers were decoded uh, in total. We show them, obviously, examples, plenty of examples. What does a village look like? What does a village doesn't look like? Uh, because, obviously, there were very, some confusing features. Um, and, and that was it. We also gave them a forum where they could help each other, discuss with each other, where they could ask detailed questions. And, and it was amazing. People, especially on the forum, people found everything from villages that were burning right then, right at, the, at that moment, to military camps, to secret airports, and all sorts of really cool stuff. And they went mad about the project. Now, once we found all these villages, the next step of the project was to check whether the villages were destroyed or not. So we gave them another, another task which was kind of, have you, have you played those spot the difference games in, in newspapers where you have two images that are kind of the same but there are some things that differ? So we, we were inspired by that and we gave them two images of the same village before and after what we consider to be an attack. And they had to answer again very simple questions. Do you see a change? And then when, when they did see a change, we asked them whether there are more houses or less houses in that. So this is a very clear example of a village that was completely destroyed. You can see um, in the before image, there's houses, there's trees, there's fences, and all sorts of uh, signs that that's a healthy village. And over there, you see just like some little squares where the walls used to be. So all those, um, yeah, destroyed, destroyed, um, destroyed houses. Um, the results, so we were, we were really blessed. We didn't know what to expect. It was one of the first projects we did. Um, for example, like I, I didn't think that we can do all of Darfur. We thought, like, let's start with something like 3,000 square kilometers and see how far we get. And, and those 3,000 square kilometers that we started with were ready in half a day. So there was so much appetite from people, and they were so excited to contribute. So we had people contributed for, from 147 countries, um, 28,000 people just in the first phase. And all together with the second phase, we had about 35,000 people. Um, they submitted crazy amount of tasks. So what I showed you before is the equivalent of a task. So yeah, 1.2 1, 1 million tasks. Um, almost all of that were completed. And in terms of time contributed, was the equivalent of a person working full time for four years. And that was in, in few weeks' time. So we were kind of blown away by, by this. It was, it was pretty amazing to have, to have all these people excited to contribute. One of the, the kind of least expected aspects of this was just not that we have data from it, um, but that we have people that are extremely engaged. They felt more empathy towards Darfur because they, they got to see with their own eyes 
the evidence of destruction. They got to see what human rights violations mean in that case. They got to kind of analyze and be investigators in that case. Uh, they got to talk to each other about what we can do about our force. It wasn't just sign a petition and we'll go with the petition to this political target and we'll tell them change something. But it was really them meaningfully participating in the project and helping us do something that we couldn't do without them. So what we're doing now, um, I told you that we have a problem of data overload. Now we have a bigger problem of data overload because whereas we had some satellite images before, now we have as well 1.2 million data rows to analyze. <laughs> um, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about how we do verification on the project um, and how reliable the data is because that's one of the questions that I, I get asked most often. So those 1.2 million tasks are more than what we need. So there are, we had something like 300,000 tasks in total, but we wanted to have redundancy. We wanted each task to be done multiple times so that we calculate some sort of agreement in the crowd. And we're, we're doing quite a lot of analysis now on reliability of the data. So are these decoders, these people that contribute online from their home, that do kind of digital volunteering, are they reliable? Can we really use the information they give us for research? And Amnesty is an organization that cares a lot about, you know, they have to do things right. Researchers have something like three PhDs, and nobody trusts the regular Joe that sits at, at home on his couch and does research for us, right? So is this, everybody's a bit anxious, like, is this reliable? So we've done, we've done analysis. We compared contributions of the decoders with contributions of two experts in Amnesty to see to what extent they agree. What we found is that People by themselves from the crowd are averagely reliable. But when you take their contributions as a whole, when you look at the crowd almost as an individual, they become extremely reliable. So they agreed with us something like 90% more often than chance. And I say more often than chance because this project was a specific one. I told you that just 5% of, the, of the, the area of Darfur is villages. So it was very likely it was, you know, tossing a coin saying, is there village, is there no village? There was quite a good, you know, just chance opportunity to spot the villages, right? So we did quite a lot of analysis. We, hired, we worked with statisticians um, to, to understand to what extent we can rely on this data. We, we employed uh, algorithms for intercoder reliability. So this is quite um, useful in statistics when you have more people coding uh, one, one event, um, you, you do that. So yeah. The, the results were pretty good. People are very reliable. We also haven't had trolls yet, which I'm expecting in next projects, but uh, hopefully they will still not see us for a long time. Um, um, something else we're doing with the data where machine learners were really excited about this project because obviously now we have uh, training data for algorithms that could detect villages in remote areas of Darfur or of Sudan or of Africa in general because the, the geography is pretty similar. Uh, and we, can, we are looking into potentially extending the work that decoders have done. So they, decoders have extended the work of researchers and now we're trying to extend their work uh, through machine learning. So I think this, the future of this project is really a combination of people and algorithm, algorithms because none of them are perfect. People are not perfect, they miss things. Uh, algorithms are really not perfect these days. So what we really want to do is a, a combination of, of the two to, to, to get the best, the best of both worlds. Um, I'm going to leave it there. These are my contact details if you, if you want to stay in touch. We're, we're working on new projects. The next one is looking at uh, the Niger Delta. Companies like Shell and ENI are publishing handwritten scan documents about oil spills, and they do that on purpose so that we can't really do anything with their, with their documents. Uh, so we're going to ask decoders to help us digitize these documents, so extract key pieces of information from there. Uh, we're looking again to do more satellite imagery projects. Uh, we're looking at any kind of messy data that Amnesty or other organizations have, and they want to they want to digitize, they want to use, and they just simply don't have time to. So if you have this kind of problems, come talk to me in the breaks. I'd be really happy to share what we've learned through this.